This conference will now be recorded. Welcome to the Planning a Zero Waste Congregation webinar, Learning Lab. Uh, this is part of our Faithful Green Team Leaders Training. It's an opportunity for congregation members to learn how to go zero waste, that is by reducing the uh, amount of waste going to the landfill and um, many strategies you'll learn uh, from congregations who've done that, as well as um, the expertise of our speaker, our guest speaker tonight, who uh, has worked on this uh, very uh, intensively. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our uh, presenter, Beth Gingold, who is uh, the founder of Recycle Leaders. And she's going to share some really uh, concrete strategies for how you can go zero waste. So take it away, Beth. Um, and just say next when you're ready for me to, to uh, advance the slides. OK, great. Hi, this is Beth Dingold. Um, I just first wanted to say how excited I am to be part of this initiative from the Interfaith Partners for the Chesapeake. Um, I'm participating just like you as a um, person who's learning how to be a green team leader in my congregation. Um, I practice with the Stillwater Mindfulness Practice Center, which is in Silver Spring, Maryland. And as Kolya mentioned, I also, in my professional life, I am a basically a zero waste consultant and I've worked with more than a hundred schools and places of worship on how to get waste programs started. So I'm really excited to be able to share that experience with you and also to hear from the other presenters and from you all about your experiences. So the first thing I wanted to do was kind of just ask you to reflect on what inspires you to work on this topic. Um, next slide. Uh, because what inspires me is all of you. The idea that there's 100 people who signed on to this call today um, means that you're probably a lot like the people in these pictures. Because throughout my experience <clears throat> with schools and organizations, I basically find that every organization has somebody in it who wants to start a waste program and maybe just doesn't know how to do it. And so what inspires me is being able to find these people, help them, and then, and then connect them to each other. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is actually a question for you. Um, it's also a question for me, but thinking about you know, working on big issues like sustainability and zero waste, I've kind of found that there's, uh, you know, different communities of practice that approach this from different perspectives. And, you know, there's you as you know, you probably uh, you may identify with with one of these different approaches. So, you know, there's the researchers who really want to look at where, you know, what does the data say about what we should do? Um, I actually started my career really on the research side. I worked on um, global forest cover change and, and climate change in my research life. Um, but then there's the people who like to approach the problem. I like to call them the change makers, the people who's like, okay, <laughs> like, how do we do this on the ground? How do we make this happen? Um, and I'm very lucky to be part of a community of you know, sustainability coordinators from across the country. So I spent five years managing the recycling program for DC public schools. And through that, I really had the opportunity to um, get connected with all of these kind of more action oriented change maker folks. Um, and then there's the activists. So people who want to act more on a policy level. Um, and I'm very grateful to be part of this community, especially the interfaith um, climate action community, 
Um, I'm involved with the Montgomery County Faith Action for Climate Solutions group. Um, and so those are different communities that I interact with, uh, but I've kind of learned from myself that the way that I like to make change in the world is really on the operation side. You know, how do we actually operationalize a zero waste program? So that's kind of what I'll be talking today, but I also wanna appreciate everyone who has these other strengths, right? The activists who are working more on the policy level um, and the researchers who are kind of making all of this happen. Uh, but I would encourage you as you're thinking about doing something on zero waste to think about, you know, what is it that, which of these approaches do you enjoy the most and how do you want to um, contribute to this really huge uh, global challenge? Uh, next slide. So why reduce waste? Um, I think if you're on this call, you probably have, you know, come with reasons why you're here. So for this kind of audience, I usually, I mean, for me right now, climate change. Um, especially if you look at food waste, um, food waste has been identified by Project Act Drawdown as the number three global solution to what we need to do to solve climate change. And that is not so much about composting, although composting is great. It's more about how do we reduce the amount of resources that goes into producing our food. Uh, but right now, that's what I would say is kind of my driving factor. Um, next slide. Uh, but at the same time, thinking about uh, how do we get everyone on board for you know, a zero waste initiative or any sustainability initiative? Um, it's also um, when I talk to different audiences, I may come with uh, different reasons. I've actually taken recycling communications trainings. And you know, for kids, it's nature. Right? Um, for I've been part of, you know, if you're trying to work with more operations or professional aged people, it's, you know, talk about money and how it saves money. Um, personally, if I'm going to talk to my own um, faith community, you know, I might talk about how, you know, pick some of the writings by our spiritual leader, um, Thich Nhat Hanh. So, um, but it's just really important to think about not just what inspires, kind of in addition to what inspires you and makes you excited about it, um, what is it that might get other people on board? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other thing to really start the idea is like, what does success actually look like? And the reason why it's important to think about this is because the clearer idea you have about what it is that you're trying to achieve and the clearer that you can be about communicating that to other people, the more likely you're gonna be able to achieve that goal. Next slide. And so when it comes to zero waste, um, there are, you know, I could go into the weeds of technical definitions of what different, um, what zero waste is, but kind of from a conceptual idea, the idea is to try to avoid or reduce as much as waste as possible. And then as much as possible, if there are materials that we've used to try to uh, deal with them responsibly. So I have to say simply, you know, we reduce first and we recycle right. And thinking about what recycle right looking like looks like, it means everyone's putting the right things in the right bins and getting um, to the right facilities. Um, and if you're paying attention to what's going on in the recycling world, we can, um, talk a little bit maybe about some of the issues there later. But the other way I like to visualize success is more of a math way. If you think of like a pie chart of that, look, that is your whole waste and that shows the percentage waste that's going to a landfill or incinerator versus uh, going to compost or recycling. And then you want to imagine both the, the part that's getting uh, diverted to become bigger, but also thinking of the whole pie chart gradually shrinking until it disappears. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to share with you some 
examples of what it, this looks like in practice. Um, I'm sure that actually many of you have uh, great examples that I look forward to hearing to. But um, so, for example, for my own congregation, when we did our New Year's brunch, we wanted to make it low waste, and this is all of the waste that we generated in our 30-person um, brunch. Um, Chinmaya Mission is a as a Hindu organization that had launched a composting program that has now morphed into you know, all these things they're doing to reduce waste and, you know, reusable items. They, they have a really exciting program going on. And then this is my friend, Sam Mason, who is on this call. He's at um, St. Patrick, Patrick's Episcopal. Like, if you ever want to feel better about the world, you can, you should go to the school like this one, where they have so many, um, you know, composting going on. But also, you know, you can walk down the hallway and see the, the map of the U.S. and where our food comes from. And so you can see how what the students are learning is really being put into practice um, on a daily basis. So next slide. Um, and then, you know, you can start with thinking about what you do in your own building or congregation. But you can also think about how bigger success means you know, inspiring others and, and sharing. And so actually one thing that you might want to think about is in addition to being so many congregations also kind of are own a building, right? So when there's events in your building or other organizations using your building, um, can you set expectations that how they manage waste according to how you do it? Um, I know that IPC also organizes field trips, like peer-to-peer -peer learning is basically the best way to spread your good practices. Um, and also, once people are engaged in this topic, they, especially your more activist people, might want to start um, working more on a, on a policy level. The next slide, please. And before you start doing anything, the other question that you really want to think about is how are you actually going to measure your success? Um, because if you really have a goal that you want to achieve zero waste, you need to be able to um, you know, know where you're going, know where you are, and be able to track progress towards how you're going to get there. Um, so next slide, slide please. Um, and depending on your your goals and your short term and your long term goals, you'll want to be collecting different types of data in order to advance to those particular goals. So often, uh, you know, one first goal might be to meet the legal requirements of recycling correctly. And in order to track progress towards that goal, you may want to do visual waste audits that where you, you know, count the percentage correct of bins. Um, if you're once you're kind of beyond that and trying to increase the types of things you recycle, maybe adding a food waste recycling program, you're going to be wanting to track um, your, you know, you'll need to measure how much capacity you need um, once you get to uh, the other level of reducing, you'll be wanting to track um, different, maybe different types of numbers of items of single-use plastic. So depending on what you, when, where you are in your process, you'll really want to be using different data to track different goals. Um, next slide, please. So how to actually plan for a zero waste congregation. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm going to give you just a very short and broad framework overview of this. Um, every congregation is different, right? So some congregations have commercial kitchens that are producing large amounts of food. Maybe there's a school involved. Um, some congregations are, you know, not even in a building. So you know, how to uh, approach it a bit. So I'm going to give you kind of some like general, general framework to how to approach the problem. Um, and I would encourage you to follow up with IPC about, you know, how to operationalize 
something for your own congregation. Um, next slide. Um, so if you remember earlier, I said that we want to reduce first and recycle right. Um, and now I'm going to tell you that in order to operationalize a program, it's actually easiest to start with recycling and then move up the zero waste hierarchy. And there's kind of a lot in what I just said. Um, but the reason why recycling is such a great first step is because it gets people to sort the waste into different categories. And the first step towards being able to reduce the waste is to know what it is that you're wasting. So while recycling isn't the end goal, um, that step of getting to be able to know what it is that we're wasting is just like a huge critical first step towards being able to get to the eventual goal of reducing all of the different types of waste. Um, so this, this five steps to recycle right is actually a framework that I developed when I was um, working with the DC public schools and we generalized it for um, charter schools and actually it's basically it's generalizable for any type of building um, including especially faith organizations that have green teams right because there are so many similarities between doing this with schools and faith organizations um, that it's it's very uh, lessons learned can be very applicable in both situations um, and just quickly on the zero waste hierarchy it's the idea that you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, that we want to focus more on eventually getting up to reduce. Um, next slide, please. And if there's one thing that I hope you get out of this presentation, um, it's this, this message. All of the research on with the social marketing around recycling, that's research that looks at how do you actually change people's behavior, has found that there's actually little or no relationship between individual awareness about waste and recycling and actually individual behaviors in what they actually do. So what is correlated to recycling behaviors is habits and norms, um, and those are things that, um, you know, working with an organization that have more to do with how expectations are set around how the organization operates. So a lot of people, especially um, people, those of us who are very excited about why we should do this, um, tend to focus on trying to get people to care first um, and then are trying to educate people from the beginning. Um, but without necessarily putting the things in place to allow people to actually take the actions that we want. So we're focused, I'm focusing here on how do you get people, how do you get an organization to actually change their behavior? Um, next slide. So of the five steps to success, um, the most important one and the one that is often kind of least um actually done is to create accountability and this is also very important to think about because particularly because a lot of uh, sustainability initiatives are started by you know green teams or volunteers or people who care about sustainability often they you know when the enthusiastic person is you know no longer available or gets burnt out right um often those programs then just kind of just stop working. So if we really want to achieve a zero waste goal, which is a hard thing to do, that actually involves changing a lot of people's behavior, um, there really needs to be, uh, I like to say the magic triangle, right? It has to be leadership, education, and operations, all of those aspects working together. And the best way to make that kind of acknowledged is to have an actual you know, written commitment plan that includes setting goals and measurable targets, um, actually designating roles and responsibilities. And it doesn't have to be that, you know, heavy lifting for a lot of people. It's just 
um, you know, there will be heavy lifting for some people, particularly in the change process. But in the long term, um, it's not going to be harder for people. It just needs to be clear what everybody needs to do. Um, and then also, what is the process for make you know monitoring, evaluation, collecting data, and making sure that we know how we're we're doing. Um, and if you have that very clearly laid out, it makes the rest of all of the steps um, much more easy to implement. Um, so this is the most important. It's also the hardest to actually do. <laughs> so um, I wanted to just highlight this as kind of the key to making a, a zero waste program successful in the long term. Next slide. Um, so in terms of steps two to five, I'm going to just mainly summarize them, but the things that the, kind of the other pieces to have that you'll need to have in place are your, you know, your hauling services. So that is a contracted service. Um, a lot of I mean, jurisdictions are different, but most of the jurisdictions around here require um, recycling and re like treat churches and other and to like nonprofits, faith organization buildings, schools as commercial facilities that are required to um, recycle. So it's very important to you know know who's in charge of that from operationally and to work with them. Um, if you need help with that, we also work with the community for per um, sorry the <laughs> community purchasing alliance um, is basically. Uh, helps uh, faith and schools and nonprofits to do group purchasing, including on uh, trash and recycling. It can save a lot of money. Um, also, then third is making sure that your standard operating procedures are clear and being followed, and that if you have you no know, cleaning staff, that they're engaged as as leaders and as part of the program. Um, often, when you find someone on the the custodial team. Who can who is an who is an advocate? That's like the best thing that happens to a program. Um, and then once you're clear on the operational side, you know, purchasing and setting up supplies, you really want to have standardized bins, lids, labels, liners, color coding. Um, you know, we can we can geek out on the details <laughs> of that um, afterwards. But then you'll notice that the fifth step is communicating sorting procedures. So again, a lot of people tend to start with, you know, how do we communicate things to everybody? But you really find that most people are willing to go along with what everyone else does. Um, when, the, when it's very clear and obvious and easy what people are supposed to do, they'll mainly, mainly do it. So the really heavy lifting is actually putting together a system in place to make it easy for other people to um, participate in. So once you have that put together, then you can do all sorts of creative things about you know, with your green teams and communicating and raising awareness um, and, and celebrating that you have this really awesome program because a lot of people will be very happy about it and actually, You'll find people who you didn't know would be excited about it, will come up to you and want to be part of it and, and be happy that you're doing it, especially young people. Um, they really want this stuff to be happening. And actually, they're very disappointed that adults, you know, when they can't do it. So, so that's kind of a summary of the steps two to five of the recycle, right? And once you have that in place, um, you it makes it easier to start looking at other things like well why are we using single-use plastics and how can we um maybe add food composting or how can we reduce food waste um, but this is really kind of what when you build your team that can get this done it really sets the stage for being able to do all sorts of other things uh, next slide and just as a, as a closing message, um, well, happy Earth Month. Um, Earth Day is coming up April 22nd, and every Earth Day is a great hook to um, get commitments from leaders and to celebrate, you know, progress that you're making. Um, this month or this year's the Earth Day theme is climate action, 
and it's a little more challenging than usual uh, right now to be part of things we normally do. But one thing that if you're interested, I'm actually working with several schools, DC schools, um, on an initiative called Team Up on Food Waste at Home. It's a challenge, it's a food waste challenge that students can do at home over the course of four weeks. And so we're creating this civic learning opportunity for these particular teachers. And we thought that we would open it up to anyone who wants to participate. Um, so you're welcome to participate in that. We're asking people to sign up by um, April 6th so that we can send you send more information about how to participate. Next slide. Yeah, and then I just wanted to say thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this and listening. And I really am looking forward to you know, hearing your questions, but also to learning from you and, and your ideas on this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. This has been really informative, inspiring, and I hope that folks have lots of ideas generated by your presentation. Um, uh, we will save questions uh, until the end after we have two congregation leaders uh, share with us. Um, and I will say that I got caught up in the technical aspects at the beginning and neglected to offer a prayer. So I'm going to save the oh. prayer for the. I'm going to save the prayer for the end uh, as a closing prayer. So, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to move on to our next speaker, and uh, that is um, Barry Kravitz who is a green team leader at Shara Torah Synagogue in Gaithersburg. And she's gonna share um, uh, about how they conducted a zero waste Kiddush. And if you could explain what Kiddush is and um, what Tubishvat is uh, along with the actions that you took. And I'm gonna share some of the images and slides that of, of uh, the table tents they use and the various signage. Uh, to convey their zero waste uh, program during the Kiddush. Um, hi, can everyone hear me? Um, yes. So yeah, that was going to be the first thing I was going to do was to uh, give you a little vocabulary. Um, so um, after our um, Saturday morning services, uh, we typically have a Kiddush, which can be anything from a snack to a a sit down lunch we we gather together and and usually it's it's bagels and some other typical um traditional foods um and um the green team hosted a kiddish um not this past january the january before uh for tubishvat uh tubishvat is is kind of a little known holiday which um has turned into a uh an environmental kind of uh, rallying holiday. It is um, the what we call the birthday of the trees. Um, in Jewish law, you cannot harvest uh, fruit from a tree until it is three years old. Well, how do you figure out how old a tree is? You start counting on Tu B'Shvat. So if you plant a tree on Tu B'Shvat, you, you get a year for free. Um, the next two bishvat it's two years old. The next two bishvat it's three years old, and you can start harvesting those um, any fruits, almonds, uh, olives, uh, various fruits. So um, because it's it's um, a tree-based holiday, it has uh, become kind of a, a an environmental um, <clears throat> key where we we talk about the earth and and stewardship and and respect for the environment. So um, I just um, wanted to quickly uh, talk about um, the, the goals of our green team, which um, we kind of folded into our um, Tu B'Shvat uh, celebration. Um, our principles are, um, are using um, sustainable uh, power sources, uh, participation in um, uh, what we call Good Deeds Day, which is a uh, uh, area-wide um, volunteering day um, in which we do stream cleanups, um, a recycling program at the synagogue, conservation landscaping, uh, bringing in educational speakers, and reducing use of plastics. 
Um, and all of our programs, we try to set an example for our congregants so that they can see these principles in practice and then take them home um, and hopefully put them into practice at home. So um, for the Tubishvat uh, program, we um, thought about going vegan, but then we thought we might have a little bit of pushback. So we went vegetarian um, because we knew that the egg salad was gonna be in high demand. Um, and we bought pretty much all of our produce and eggs through our CSA, um, which was a really nice partnering because usually we just get deliveries from them, whatever it is that they are supplying um, at that time, but uh, we really worked with them to get a whole bunch of stuff that we don't normally see from them. Um, and it was a, a really nice uh, partnership. So um, we, we made some foods that were a little different. Uh, the menu was a little bit different. And um, I guess you can go to the next slide. I think we, um, we decided to make all the, 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 the things that we used for the, the kiddish um, either um, compostable or recyclable. Um, compost is kind of tricky because um, things that are marked compostable are only compostable in, in industrial compost and um, not really a, a backyard composting. So we tried to make that clear to people. Yes, these spoons, these cups are compostable, but you shouldn't expect to be able to throw them in the compost pile that's in your backyard. We did collect everything up and take it to the, um, the Gaithersburg um, compost spot um, which, which you need to bring your own uh, materials there. They, they don't pick up, but um, we had volunteers who collected everything up and took it there. So with all the food preparation and all the food consumption, we generated one little shopping bag of landfill waste. Everything else either went to compost or, or recycling. Um, next slide. So we, um, we tried to educate people of what um, items were compostable and point out which ones they could compost at home, which kinds of things um, they could take to, to the Gaithersburg site. Um, and um, the green team is, is trying throughout the year to um, reduce or eliminate plastics. Uh, we kind of go back and forth. Um, should we buy these more expensive items that are made from corn or sugarcane or whatever, um, or the petroleum-based ones, um, save that money and use it towards something that maybe is more impactful? We kind of go back and forth a lot, and we haven't really found um, a good happy medium, but uh, it's something that, that we're working on. Um, next slide. So um, one of the key items that we had at the Kiddush was on each table, we had um, these table tents. So they were folded in half and there was text on each side. Um, and um, the text said, get, gave people a list of options of things that they normally use. And then we gave them options of things that they could use instead that were less wasteful. And um, those were all put into practice at the Kiddush so they could see them in practice, that the plates were not ugly, the, the forks didn't break when you tried to use them, um, things like that. We, we uh, wanted to show people that this is something that you could easily do. And um, I don't think this table tent um, says, I wanna read one of the, one of the other ones um, that we had. Um, the zero waste event, we call it a, a Z we event. And I don't know if that's something we made up or if that's a, a term that's common to use, but the tent said today's kiddish is a Z we event. On average, every person in Maryland produces 13.7 tons of landfill trash each year. That's 75 pounds of waste per person per day. But our kiddish is a Z we zero waste event. 
We focus the menu on local homemade foods to reduce packaging and transportation waste. We're using cloth table covers instead of plastic. Our signs and table tents are made from repurposed and recycled paper, and everything else is compostable or recyclable. So instead of creating bags and bags of landfill waste, we invite you to dispose of your compostables in our compost bins and your recyclables in the blue recycling bins. And it was amazing. People had no trouble. We, we thought there would be a steep learning curve, but um, they, they really um, found it very easy to participate. Is there another slide? I think that might be the end. Yeah, so um, yeah, that, that is awesome, Barry. Thank you. It, it, it <laughs> uh, I'm not I don't think so. I'm um, just that we're, we're trying to continue to work with um, with our executive director, um, reducing the plastics. And um, we've already gotten rid of the styrofoam. Um, there are some some certain challenges um, being a synagogue that keeps kosher. We, we can't reuse. Um, plates and and flatware and cups everything has to be single use um, we'd have no dishwashing facility um, the kitchen is very small and very ill equipped um, so it, it it's a challenge but i i think we can find some good compromises that uh, reduce the waste well, thank you. I, I have to say that what comes through for the, to me on this is uh, the, all the creativity that your team put into this. And uh, thank you for sharing. And um, we'll, again, we'll hold questions and comments toward the end after we have our next presenter. And that is Thelma Trish. And uh, she's a green team leader at St. Columbus Episcopal Church in Washington, DC. Uh, welcome, Thelma. See if Thelma's got her audio on here. Let's see. Oops. Let me make sure she's able to turn hers on. Just wait and see if Thelma needs to get her uh, audio and her video turned oh, on. Okay. Not, not her video on. Yeah. Great. All right. Go ahead. I wanted to say that so far we've uh, not been able to see the speaker. We see you, but we don't see the speaker. Yeah, that's so, intentional. Okay, great. That's fine. Um, so in 2013, stimulated by conversations we were having at St. Columbus Environment Committee, I approached the annual picnic committee and proposed that we make the picnic a zero waste event. And I offered to manage the entire zero waste operation. After some initial resistance, the proposal to use compostable dinnerware and collect and compost all waste food was accepted. St. Columbus Nursery School was already practicing zero waste, and I got a lot of help from the nursery school science teacher who provided compost bins and colorful signage. I recruited 15 volunteers to set up and manage two zero waste stations and clean up afterwards. Next. This is a photo of our first zero waste station. And um, we had volunteers at the stations throughout the picnic to explain zero waste and show picnic goers where to dispose of their waste. Next. The results were gratifying. 450 guests attended and they were very receptive and appreciative of our efforts. As a result, we collected less than two pounds of landfill waste. That was from the picnic goers, not from the caterer. We did not control the caterer's waste. There was a lot of food waste, but at least it went to compost. Mm. Next. Since 2013, every annual picnic, or now we call it a brunch, has been a zero waste event. We've also introduced zero waste at other large events, such as the Mardi Gras party and potluck suppers. A big step was getting the picnic committee to serve lemonade and ice water from dispensers instead of sodas and box juice. The Environment Committee bought stainless flatware for the church. We simplified the zero waste stations and our signage to make it easier for people to put waste in the correct bin. 
And we also managed to reduce food waste by asking people to take only what they could eat, asking the caterer to serve smaller portions and allow people to come back for seconds. Next. This is our more simplified zero waste station. Uh, so far, we always have volunteers standing at the stations to direct the disposal of waste. Next. Further progress was made in 2014 when an environmental committee member proposed that we introduce donated used ceramic coffee mugs on Sundays. And he recruited environment committee members to wash them. Needless to say, the Sunday hospitality leader was very receptive because she was particularly delighted to get seven or eight new volunteers. In addition, she bought washable plastic cups for the children's juice. We still provide compostable coffee cups to those who want to take their coffee or tea away, but we've greatly reduced expenditures on disposables. From 2013 to 2019, I was chair of St. Columbus Water Ministry program that provides showers, laundry service, and a hot meal to our vulnerable neighbors four days a week. I was gradually able to introduce washable dinnerware into our meal service and eliminate most disposables. The operations manager agreed to stock only compostable disposables, disposable dinnerware, and that's available to all groups who have a gathering, whether large or small. In an effort to get other groups on board, I drafted the guidelines for planning a zero waste event. Next. In 2015, a new rector was called to St. Columbus and he was committed to environmental sustainability, both in its practical and its spiritual dimensions. Soon afterwards, members of the Environment Committee drafted a zero waste policy statement and submitted it to St. Columbus Vestry which is our governing body. It was adopted in June 2016. As a result of another proposal, the church contracted a weekly industrial compost collection service. So we were no longer dependent on the nursery school's contract, which could not accept the disposable uh, dinnerware, but our new one does. Gradually, other ministry leaders became more aware and interested. Next. But a number of challenges remain. The policy statement adopted by the vestry was an endorsement in principle, but not a commitment to action. Zero waste was being implemented at big events, but not at small gatherings of St. Columbus many groups. Few groups were using the guidelines I had prepared. Zero waste was completely ad hoc and volunteer driven. The maintenance and housekeeping staff were not involved, so it was not institutionalized. And we sometimes got resistance from event planners because of the additional work involved. Next. Um, let's see. Ne uh, let's see. I think the next one is uh, the slide number 10. Mm. This one? Um, nope, going back. Okay, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, this was a frustrating time for me, to be honest, and I was looking for a way to take the initiative to the next level in a, in a you know, gracious <laughs> manner. <laughs> the Environment Committee had organized several environmental awareness programs and classes, and we knew that parishioners were receptive, but the lack of continuity and consistency was a problem. The opportunity came in the summer of 2018 when the former operations manager retired. The interim operations team included two longtime, highly respected parishioners who were committed to environmental sustainability. Our very talented communications director was also very supportive. I presented a proposal to create eight permanent zero waste stations to them. They presented it to the rector and it was accepted. The communications director produced color coded signage for the stations and we ordered a few new bins, but we also repurpose the existing bins that the church already had. Finally, I inquired and was assured by the rector that the job description for the new operations manager included a commitment to environmental sustainability. Great. Next. So recently, uh, we had a major breakthrough, at least I felt like I did. Um, 
The operations manager had begun to ask all event planners, internal and external, to follow the zero waste guidelines, but it wasn't really enforced, it was a request. One member of the operations staff was very committed and conscientious, and when he was on duty, the compostables went to the compost contractor's bins. But when he was not on duty, the compost collected by volunteers often ended up in the landfill dumpster. This and the operation manager's own realization that we needed to be a more collaborative community led him to conclude that the housekeeping staff should be more involved in zero waste. He asked me to train housekeeping staff on zero waste so they could help with the zero waste stations at big events and so that the waste collected in the various bins and the permanent stations would be disposed of correctly. Now, I had been offering to train staff for years, six years, but no one ever took me up on it. So this seemed like a blessing. You know, it was truly a moment of grace for me. Next. One of the key lessons from our experience is that you need champions who will push for change. You need committed volunteers who are willing to put in the extra time. We had several champions. Uh, I might have been the initial, you know, sort of person who initiated the, the uh, initiative, but several other people you know, uh, came forward when the need was there. It's very important to look for opportunities such as an annual picnic or the hiring of a new operations manager. Be patient and work around the constraints and be compassionate about the fact that church staff usually are facing a number of challenges. Mm -hmm. Getting children involved is key. They are our future and they influence their parents. Change requires ongoing education and reminders. Finally, we need to emphasize the spiritual dimension of this. It's our need to be connected to one another, and to the universe, and our desire to protect God's wonderful creation that inspire us and can make zero ways to form of prayer. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Falma. What a wonderful way to end. And um, all thank you for all of your hard work. <laughs> and uh, you've told uh, an excellent uh, history of all the victories and challenges along the way. <laughs> um, we are now going to, um, uh, first of all, I want to thank the other presenters too, along with Barry and uh, Barry Kravitz from Charatora and um, Beth Gingold of Recycling Leaders, it, you all have just been fantastic and in informing uh, us about how we can get started and learning from your experience. Um, I'm going, we're going to open up to questions now. We have some questions in the chat that I'm going to field and then um, we're going to actually see if there's others that haven't had a chance to put anything in the chat to ask. Um, uh, questions that they uh, would like to ask directly. Um, so one question I had uh, that came from someone to Barry is um, is wondering if Barry has been able to track if members have adopted these practices for their simchas. Simchas. And I, confess, I confess ignorance. <laughs> So, so a simcha is um, a wedding or a bar mitzvah or a baby naming or in, in any kind of happy occasion where we typically have a, a, a bigger kiddish. Um, and the answer is those haven't happened yet. We are um, writing up some guidelines um, that would will be optional. Um, what we're trying to do is to um, have the regular um, kiddish uh, always be compostable and recyclable. Those those would be the items that are kept um, in storage in the synagogue and and that people would pull from for for a regular event. Typically, a, a bar mitzvah, you know, you'll have the 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 boys' favorite sports team colors or you know a, a unicorn theme or whatever. Things tend to get a little more colorful and and heavily plastic. Um, but we will be giving people the option for using less uh, wasteful materials. Thank you. Um, I've now learned something about simchas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to note, in case people didn't see it in the chat, that for the Baltimore area, 
uh, William uh, Bill Brakey offered this uh, resource, which is the Veterans Compost for Industrial Scale Composting. So um, those folks who are in the Baltimore area, that's an option for you. And um, looking to see if there's any other questions in the chat. Uh, most of them were more about the presentation, et cetera. Um, one, one person was asking, um, and this is for Thelma, um, okay. were the plastic bags that you used after the picnic, were those compostable? And if they were, you know, you could let people know where to get them. Well, originally, initially, we did use compostable bags. They are expensive and they are very fragile. And uh, when we hired, when we contracted with Veteran Compost, which is also available in the Washington DC area, I asked Fritz, the owner, whether we should be using compostable bags. And he said, no. He said he sends, he uses uh, plastic bags in his bins and he sends them all to a waste to energy facility. So hmm. we stopped using compostable bags. Hmm. Okay. Now, thank you, Thelma. Any other questions uh, folks would like to uh, ask? Uh, unmute yourself, you know, click on your mic and it should turn green so you can say something. Uh, this this is part. Paul. I got Go a, question, a question directed to me about, um, is it better to use energy to wash dishes with an industrial dishwasher or to use compostable plates, dishes, et cetera? Um, and it's great to ask these types of questions because, um, you know, there are trade-offs in every decision that we make. The studies that I have seen do kind of indicate that in the long run, switching to reusables um, is the long run better option. Um, there's also now with compostable plates, there's issues with chemicals that are in them. Um, but yeah, industrial dishwashers also use a lot of energy. So Energy Star dishwashers are something that we would recommend. But yeah, kind of in the overall, the research that I've seen on this has typically come out with uh, reusables as the the better option. Great, great question. I Can do I see also for information. I see someone suggested um, a resource. And I will say there will be some other resources that uh, will further inform you, some from Thelma and elsewhere, uh, to accompany the recording when we send that out and also post on our website. There'll be uh, print resources or you can read them online. This one suggested is um, to please tell folks there's a guide called Green and Just Celebrations put out by Jews United for Justice. That may, may have come from Barry, but it's it's uh, green and just celebrations put out by Jews United for Justice, and it's available online. Oh, it's bon from Bonnie Sorak. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, Bonnie. <laughs> Anyone else have some burning? Um, I see the question about garbage disposals came up. Is that better than composting? Um, so the challenge with garbage disposals is that. Well, one, things like coffee grounds should not go in your garbage disposal because it messes up the whole system. But also when things are going down your garbage disposal, it's kind of getting into your, you know, it kind of eventually goes into our dis the sewer system. So like in DC, going into DC water um, and being mixed with all these other materials. So when you're composting, you're actually, you know, maintaining the value of the organic matter and having it go into, you know, being able to use to, um, you know, back to the soil and to, to grow more plants. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And actually on the compostable bags, um, different facilities have different rules about compostable bags. You know, Veterans Compost has actually put a lot of thought <laughs> into the issue because, um, in any case, any types of bags you have to screen out because you don't necessarily know which ones are compostable or which ones are um, not compostable. So 
it, in some sense, it doesn't make as much of a difference because they have to screen them out anyway. Um, but there are facilities that do ask for, you know, can you do compostable bags because in the, you know, it, they do kind of break down better if they do stay in the compost, but they are really expensive. So it's another one where you really want to follow the directions that your your hauler processor tells you about where it's going. Great, thanks, uh, Beth. Another uh, question, I think this is probably to either uh, Barry or Thelma. Uh, I know Barry said you definitely had used compostable uh, plates and plastic ware. Um, probably you have different suppliers. Uh, people want to know where, where do you get this stuff? <laughs> Um, we went to Costco and Amazon, okay. and that's where we found everything. Uh, you Great. can't do that right now, but um, yeah. when we're a lot out of the house again, <laughs> and Amazon is back to the regular shipping, then um, then you could do that. Yeah, yeah. Ours, we order ours from uh, I think from a place called Eco Products. But yeah, I've seen them suppliers. also. Yeah. And I mean, if you order, you know, a large volume online, you get a, a big discount. Great, thank you. Um, oh, someone asked, and yeah, uh, yeah, Anna wanted me to remind me to ask you, Thelma, to uh, your statement, and we'll we'll also post that. I think it's good for people to have examples of how uh, how your congregation and others have have comprised their own policy statement about these things and how to I think I time. said I did send you the policy statement okay I'll, I'll make sure that we post that thank you <laughs> um, let's see okay that's there I'm making sure and anybody else who want to chime in on your mic we can uh, certainly let's see um, I think we yeah, so it's 8 p.m. So we yep. might just have time for one more question and then yeah, the closing. And then I'll, I can, or if there's no questions, I'll close out. Look at, there's two questions in the chat box. Can I just answer them really quickly? Yes, please. I, 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 um, one of them is about we have a large supply of single use plastics in the supply closet. Any advice what to do with it? If you're trying to yeah. go to the I secretly have a stash <laughs> in my kitchen. I'm like, I can't use these things because it's a bad example. Um, but one thing that you can think about is, well, especially now when people are doing, you know, food donations that um, you know, sometimes people are distributing food and using single use items um, that might be a good use for for those. Um, but I understand. <laughs> I totally understand that question. Yeah. Um, and get you know homeless shelters things like that also okay so the other question uh, what do you say to people who say recycling in baltimore county is not working well um, doesn't take plastic bags not recycling glass and having trouble selling paper waste and this is a question you know you could put a lot of different counties or cities right that are in this situation as well um, i would say to have faith because in the, so, you know, we're facing a lot of challenges right now, um, but eventually we're, we're gonna figure out how to deal with them. So eventually our markets are going to, um, you know, the fact that China doesn't take our stuff, we're gonna have to learn how to deal with it ourselves. Uh, but we don't wanna, in the meantime, lose the positive behaviors that we've spent years of trying to get people to participate in right so it's good to be you know very well informed about the issues that are happening um and also to kind of think about how to maintain the behaviors that we want people to be in the habit of doing so that when the systems are working better we don't have to go back and convince people to restart what we've been previously trying to get them to do. Yeah, well, I say amen to that, Beth. And we're gonna close out now with a prayer. I will say there were two comments about disposables. And one is, you know, when there are multiple sick people in the house and people don't, can't, you know, have the energy to wash dishes, there might be a way of 
using them in an unfortunate situation like that or donating them to a homeless shelter um, and or you know those, they might be able to use that kind of thing too. Um, so thank you one and all participants and uh, presenters today. This has been great, inspiring, and uh, I'm gonna close out with a prayer and say we will have the recording available uh, for everyone. You'll be hearing from us via email uh, and it will be posted on our website. So please join me in prayer. Oh God, source of life, creator of the universe, as we are faced with challenges, of this time as we wish everyone well in all forms of life well-being may your spirit guide us to learn actions we can take to contribute to the health healing and restoration of all your beautiful creation the whole web of life and guide us to rise to this occasion amen, amen. thank you all for joining. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.